section fourteen of an american idol this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by mary schneider an american idol the life of carlton h parker by cornelia stratton parker chapter fourteen at the end of august the little family was united again in seattle almost the clearest picture of carl i have is the eager look with which he scanned the people stepping out of our car at the station and the beam that lit up his face as he spied us there is a line in dorothy canfield's bent twig that always appealed to us the mother and father were separated for a few days to the utter anguish of the father especially and he remarked it's hell to be happily married every time we were ever separated we felt just like that in one of carl's letters from seattle he had written the atlantic monthly wants me to write an article on the i w w so the first piece of work he had to do after we got settled was that we were tremendously excited and never got over chuckling at some of the moss-grown people we knew about the country who would feel outraged at the atlantic monthly stooping to print stuff by that young radical and on such a subject how we tore at the end to get the article off on time the stenographer from the university came about two one sunday afternoon i sat on the floor up in the guest room and read the manuscript to her while she typed it off carl would rush down more copy from his study on the third floor i'd go over it while miss van doren went over what she had typed then the reading would begin again we hated to stop for supper all three of us were so excited to get the job done it had to be at the main post office that night by eleven to arrive in boston when promised at ten thirty it was in the envelope three limp people tore for the car we put miss van doren on she was to mail the article on her way home and carl and i knowing this was an occasion for a treat if ever there was one routed out a sleepy drug store clerk and ate the remains of his sunday ice cream supply i can never express how grateful i am that that article was written and published before carl died the influence of it ramified in many and the most unexpected directions i am still hearing of it we expected condemnation at the time there probably was plenty of it but only one condemner wrote on the other hand letters streamed in by the score from friends and strangers bearing the general message god bless you for it that article is particularly significant as showing his method of approach to the whole problem of the i w w after some two years of psychological study Quote, the futility of much conventional american social analysis is due to its description of the given problem in terms of its relationship to some relatively unimportant or artificial institution few of the current analyses of strikes or labor violence make use of the basic standards of human desire and intention which control these phenomena a strike and its demands are usually praised as being law-abiding or economically bearable or are condemned as being unlawful or confiscatory these four attributes of a strike are important only as incidental consequences the habit of americans thus to measure up social problems to the current temporary and more or less accidental scheme of traditions and legal institutions long ago gave birth to our national belief that passing a new law or forcing obedience to an old one was a specific for any unrest the current analysis of the i w w and its activities is an example of this perverted and unscientific method the i w w analysis which has given both satisfaction and a basis for treating the organization runs as follows the organization is unlawful in its activity un-american in its sabotage unpatriotic in its relation to the flag the government and the war the rest of the condemnation is a play upon these three attributes so proper and so sufficient has this condemnatory analysis become that it is a risky matter to approach the problem from another angle but it is now so obvious that our internal affairs are out of gear that any comprehensive scheme of national preparedness would demand that full and honest consideration be given to all forces determining the degree of american unity one force being this tabooed organization it would be best to announce here a more or less dogmatic hypothesis to which the writer will steadfastly adhere 
that human behavior results from the rather simple arithmetical combination of the inherited nature of man and the environment in which his maturing years are passed man will behave according to the hints for conduct which the accidents of his life has stamped into his memory mechanism a slum produces a mind which has only slum incidents with which to work and a spoiled and protected child seldom rises to aggressive competitive behavior simply because its past life has stored up no memory imprints from which a predisposition to vigorous life can be built the particular things called the moral attributes of man's conduct are conventionally found by contrasting this educated and trained way of acting with the exigencies and social needs or dangers of the time hence while his immoral or unpatriotic behavior may fully justify his government in imprisoning or eliminating him when it stands in some particular danger which his conduct intensifies this punishment in no way either explains his character or points to an enduring solution of his problem suppression while very often justified and necessary in the flux of human relationship always carries a social cost which must be liquidated and also a backfire danger which must be insured against the human being is born with no innate proclivity to crime or special kind of unpatriotism crime and treason are habit activities educated into man by environmental influences favorable to their development the i w w can be profitably viewed only as a psychological by-product of the neglected childhood of industrial america it is discouraging to see the problem to-day examined almost exclusively from the point of view of its relationship to patriotism and conventional commercial morality it is perhaps of value to quote the language of the most influential of the i w w leaders internal quote you ask me why the i w w is not patriotic to the united states if you were a bum without a blanket if you left your wife and kids when you went west for a job and had never located them since if your job never kept you long enough in a place to qualify you to vote if you slept in a lousy sour bunkhouse and ate food just as rotten as they could give you and get by with it if deputy sheriffs shot your cooking cans full of holes and spilled your grub on the ground if your wages were lowered on you when the bosses thought they had you down if there was one law for ford sir and mooney and another for harry thaw if every person who represented law and order and the nation beat you up railroaded you to jail and the good christian people cheered and told them to go to it how in hell do you expect a man to be patriotic this war is a business man's war and we don't see why we should go out and get shot in order to save the lovely state of affairs that we now enjoy End of internal quote. the argument was rather difficult to keep productive because gratitude that material prerequisite to patriotism seemed wanting in their attitude toward the american government their state of mind could be explained only by referring it as was earlier suggested to its major relationships the dominating concern of the i w w is what keller calls the maintenance problem their philosophy is in its simple reduction a stomach philosophy and their politico-industrial revolt could be called without injustice a hunger riot but there is an important correction to this simple statement while their way of living has seriously encroached on the urgent minima of nutrition shelter clothing and physical health it has also long outraged the american laboring class traditions touching social life sex life self-dignity and ostentation had the food and shelter been sufficient the revolt tendencies might have simmered out were the migratory labor population not keenly sensitive to traditions of a richer psychological life than mere physical maintenance End of quote. the temper of the country on this subject the general closed attitude of mind which the average man holds thereon prompt me to add here a few more of karl's generalizations and conclusions in this article if only he were here to cry aloud again and yet again on this point yet i know there are those who sense his approach and are endeavoring in every way possible to make wisdom prevail over prejudice quote, 
cynical disloyalty and contempt of the flag must in the light of modern psychology come from a mind which is devoid of national gratitude and in which the united states stirs no memory of satisfaction or happiness to those of us who normally feel loyal to the nation such a disloyal sentiment brings sharp indignation as an index of our own sentiment and our own happy relations to the nation this indignation has value as a stimulus to a program or ethical generalization it is a cause of vast inaccuracy and sad injustice american syndicalism is not a scheming group dominated by an unconventional and destructive social philosophy it is merely a commonplace attitude not such a state of mind as machiavelli or robespierre possessed but one stamped by the lowest most miserable labor conditions and outlook which american industrialism produces to those who have seen at first hand the life of the western casual laborer any reflections on his gratitude or spiritual buoyancy seem ironical humor an altogether unwarranted importance has been given to the syndicalist philosophy of the i w w a few leaders use its phraseology of these few not half a dozen know the meaning of french syndicalism or english guild socialism to the great wandering rank and file the i w w is simply the only social break in the harsh search for work that they have ever had its headquarters the only competitor of the saloon in which they are welcome it is a conventional economic truism that american industrialism is guaranteeing to some half of the forty millions of our industrial population a life of such limited happiness of such restrictions on personal development and of such misery and desolation when sickness or accident comes that we should be childish political scientists not to see that from such an environment little self-sacrificing love of country little of ethics little of gratitude could come it is unfortunate that the scientific findings of our social condition must use words which sound strangely like the phraseology of the socialists this similarity however should logically be embarrassing to the critics of these findings not to the scientists those who have investigated and studied the lower strata of american labor have long recognized the i w w as purely a symptom of a certain distressing state of affairs the casual migratory laborers are the finished product of an economic environment which seems cruelly efficient in turning out human beings modeled after all the standards which society abhors the history of the migratory workers shows that starting with the long hours and dreary winters on the farms they ran away from or the sour-smelling bunkhouse in a coal village through their character debasing experience with the drifting higher and fire life in the industries on to the vicious social and economic life of the winter unemployed their training predetermined but one outcome and the environment produced its type the i w w has importance only as an illustration of a stable american economic process its pitiful syndicalism its street corner opposition to the war are the inconsequential trimmings its strike alone faithful as it is to the american type is an illuminating thing the i w w like the grangers the knights of labor the farmers alliance the progressive party is but a phenomenon of revolt the cure lies in taking care of its psychic antecedents the stability of our republic depends on the degree of courage and wisdom with which we move to the task End quote. in this same connection i quote from another article quote, no one doubts the full propriety of the government's suppressing ruthlessly any interference of the i w w with war preparation all patriots should just as vehemently protest against all suppression of the normal protest activities of the i w w there will be neither permanent peace nor prosperity in our country till the revolt basis of the i w w is removed and until that is done the i w w remains an unfortunate valuable symptom of a diseased industrialism End quote i watch along with many others the growth of bitterness and hysteria in the treatment of labor spreading throughout the country 
and I long with many others for Karl, with his depth and sanity of understanding, coupled with his passion for justice and democracy, to be somewhere in a position of guidance for these troubled times. I am reminded here of a little incident that took place just at this time. An IWW was to come out to have dinner with us. Some other friends, faculty people, also were to be there. About noon the telephone rang. Carl went. A rich Irish broke announced, "'Ar can't come to your party tonight.' "'Why is that?' "'He's pinched, and he wants to know if he can have your Kant's critique of pure reason to read while he's in jail.'" End of section 14section fifteen of an american idol this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by mary schneider an american idol the life of carlton h parker by cornelia stratton parker chapter fifteen i am forever grateful that carl had his experience at the university of washington before he died he left the university of california a young assistant professor just one rebellious morsel in a huge machine he found himself in washington not only head of the department of economics and dean of the college of commerce and a power on the campus but a power in the community as well he was working under a president who backed him in everything to the last ditch who was keenly interested in every ambition he had for making a big thing of his work he at last could see introductory economics given as he wanted to have it given realizing at the same time that his plans were in the nature of an experiment the two textbooks used in the first semester were mcdougall's social psychology and wallace's great society during part of the time he pinned the front page of the morning paper on the board and illustrated his subject matter by an item of news of that very day his theory of education was that the first step in any subject was to awaken a keen interest and curiosity in the student for that reason he felt that pure theory in economics was too difficult for any but seniors or graduates that given too soon it tended only to discourage he allowed no note-taking in any of his courses insisted on discussion by the class no matter how large it was planned to do away with written examinations as a test of scholarship substituting instead a short oral discussion with each student individually grading them past and not past as it was because of the pressure of government work he had to resort to written tests the proportion of first sections in the final examination which was difficult was so large that carl was sure the reader must have marked too leniently and looked over the papers himself his results were the same as the readers and he felt could justifiably be used as some proof of his theory that if a student is interested in the subject you cannot keep him from doing good work i quote here from two letters written by washington students who had been under his influence but five months quote, may i as only a student add my inadequate sympathy for the loss of dr parker the most liberal man i have known while his going from my educative life can be nothing as compared to his loss from a very beautiful family group yet the enthusiasm the radiance of his personality freely given in his classes during the semester i was privileged to know him made possible to me a greater realization of the fascination of humanity than i obtained during my previous four years of college study i still look for him to enter the classroom nor shall i soon forget his ideals his faith in humanity End quote. from the second letter quote, to have known mr parker as well as i did makes me feel that i was indeed privileged and i shall always carry with me the charm and inspiration of his glorious personality the campus was never so sad as on the day which brought the news of his death it seemed almost incredible that one man in five short months could have left so indelible an impress of his character on the student body besides being of real influence on the campus he had the respect and confidence of the business world both labor and capital and in addition he stood as the representative of the government in labor adjustments and disputes and it was of lesser consequence but oh it did matter 
we had money enough to live on we had made ourselves honestly think that we had just about everything we wanted on what we got plus outside lectures in california but once we had tasted of the new-found freedom of truly enough once there was gone forever the stirring around to pick up a few extra dollars here and there to make both ends meet once we knew for the first time the satisfaction and added joy that come from some responsible person to help with the housework we felt that we were soaring through life with our feet hardly touching the ground instead of my spending most of the day in the kitchen and riding herd on the young we had our drop straight from heaven mrs willard and see what that meant every morning at nine i left the house with carl and we walked together to the university as i think of those daily walks now arm in arm rain or shine i'd not give up the memory of them for all creation carl would go over what he was to talk about that morning in introductory economics how it would have raised the hair of the orthodox econ one teacher and of course we always talked some of what marvelous children we possessed carl would begin tell me some more about the june bug he would go to his nine o'clock i to mine after my ten o'clock class and on the way to my eleven o'clock lecture i always ran into his office a second to gossip over what mail he had got that morning and how things were going generally then at twelve in his office again look at this telegram that just came how shall i answer mr so-and-so about that job and then home together not once a week but every day afternoons except the three afternoons when i played hockey i was at home but always there was the possibility that carl would ring up about five i am at a meeting downtown can't get things settled so we continue this evening run down and have supper with me and perhaps who knows a bill hart film might be around town there was mrs willard who knew just what to do and off i could fly to see my husband you can't on seventeen hundred a year i hear people nowadays scold and roar over the pay the working class are getting and how they are spending it all on nonsense and not saving a cent i stand it as long as i can and then i burst out for i too have tasted the joy of at last being able to get things we never thought we would own and of feeling the wings of financial freedom feather out where before all had been cold calculation can we do this if so what must we give up i wish every one on earth could feel it i do not care if they do not save a cent only i do wish my carl could have experienced those days a little longer it was so good so good while it lasted and it was only just starting every new call he got to another university was at a salary from one to two thousand dollars more than what we were getting even at seattle it looked as if our days of financial scrimping were gone forever we even discussed a ford nay even a four-cylinder buick and every other sunday we had fricasseed chicken and always always a frosting on the cake for the first two months in seattle we felt as if we ought to have company at every meal it did not seem right to sit down to food as good as that with just the family present and it was such fun to bring home unexpected guests and to know that mrs willard could concoct a dream of a dish while the guests were removing their hats and i not having to miss any of the conversation from being in the kitchen every other sunday night we had the whole department and their wives to sunday supper sixteen of them oh dear oh dear money does make the difference we grew more determined than ever to see that more folks in the world got more of it and yet in a sense carl was a typical professor in his unconcern over matters financial he started in the first month we were married by turning over every cent to me as a matter of course and from the beginning of each month to the end he never had the remotest idea how much money we possessed or what it was spent for so far as his peace of mind went on the whole he was a capitalist he knew we needed more money than he was making at the university of california therefore he made all he could on the outside and came home and dumped it in my lap from one year's end to the next he spent hardly five cents on himself a new suit now and then and a new hat new shirts at a sale but never a penny that was not essential on the rest of us there he needed a curbing hand i discovered him negotiating to buy me a set of jade when he was getting one hundred dollars a month 
he would bring home a box of peaches or a tray of berries when they were first in the market and eaten only by bank presidents and railway magnates and beam and say guess what surprise i have for you nothing hurt his feelings more than to have him suggest i should buy something for myself and have me answer that we could not afford it then i'll dig sewers on the side he would exclaim you buy it and i'll find the money for it somewhere if he had turned off at an angle of fifty degrees when he first started his earthly career he would have been a star example of the individual who presses the palms of his hands together and murmurs the lord will provide i never knew a man who was so far removed from the traditional idea of the proper position of the male head of the household he felt as i have said that he was not the one to have control over finances that was the wife's province then he had another attitude which certainly did not jibe with the lord of the manor idea perhaps there would be something i wanted to do and i would wait to ask him about it when he got home invariably the same thing would happen he would take my two hands and put them so that i held his coat lapels then he would place his hands on my shoulders beam all over eyes twinkling and say who's the boss of this household anyway and i had the answer i am who gets her own way one hundred per cent i do who never gets his own way and never wants to get his own way you well then you know perfectly well you are to do anything in this world you want to do with a chuckle he would add think of it not a look-in in my own home seattle as i look back on it meant the unexpected in every way our little sprees together were not the planned out ones of former years from the day carl left castle crags his time was never his own he could never count on anything from one day to the next a strike here an arbitration there government orders for this some investigation needed for that it was harassing it was wearying but always every few days there would be that telephone ring which i grew both to dread and to love for as long as it said i've got to go to tacoma it also said you girl put on your hat and coat this minute and come downtown while i have a few minutes off we'll have supper together anyhow and the feeling of the courting days never left us that almost sharp joy of being together again when we just locked arms for a block and said almost nothing nothing to repeat and the good-bye that always meant a wrench always though it might mean being together within a few hours and always the waving from the one on the back of the car to the one standing on the corner nothing nothing ever got tame after ten years if carl ever found himself a little early to catch the train for tacoma say though he had said good-bye but half hour before and was to be back that evening he would find a telephone booth and ring up to say perhaps that he was glad he had married me mrs willard once said that after hearing carl or me talk to the other over the telephone it made other husbands and wives when they telephoned sound as if they must be contemplating divorce but telephoning was an event it was a little extra present from providence as it were and i think of two times when we met accidentally on the street in seattle it seemed something we could hardly believe all the world the war commerce industry stopped while we tried to realize what had happened then every night that he had to be out and he had to be out night after night in seattle i would hear his footstep coming down the street it would wake me though he wore rubber heels he would fix the catch on the front door lock then come upstairs calling out softly you awake he always knew i was then sitting on the edge of the bed he would tell all the happenings since i had seen him last once in a while he'd sigh and say a little ranch up on the clear water would go pretty well about now wouldn't it my girl and i would sigh and say oh dear wouldn't it i remember once when we were first married he got home one afternoon before i did when i opened the door to our little seattle apartment there he was walking the floor looking as if the bottom had dropped out of the universe i've had the most awful twenty minutes he informed me simply terrible promise me absolutely that never never will you let me get home before you do to expect to find you home and then open the door into empty rooms oh, i never lived through such a twenty minutes we had a lark's whistle that we had used since before our engaged days 
Carl would whistle it under my window at the Theta House in college, and I would run down and out the side door to the utter disgust of my well-bred sisters, who arranged to make cutting remarks at the table about it in the hope that I would reform my servant-girl tactics. That whistle was whistled through those early Seattle days, through Oakland, through Cambridge, Leipzig, Berlin, Heidelberg, Munich, Swanage, Berkeley, Alamo in the country, Berkeley again. He would start it way down the hill so I could surely hear. Castle Crags and Seattle. Wherever any of us were in the house, it meant a dash for all to the front door to welcome the dad home. One evening I was scanning some article on marriage by the fire in Seattle. It was one of those rare times that Carl, too, was at home and going over lectures for the next day. It held that to be successful, marriage had to be an adjustment, a giving in here by the man, there by the woman. I said to Carl, if that is true, you must have been doing all the adjusting. I never have had to give up or fit in or relinquish one little thing, so you've been doing it all. He thought for a moment, then answered, you know, I've heard that, too, and wondered about it for I know I've given up nothing, made no adjustments. On the contrary, I seem always to have been getting more than a human being had any right to count on. It was that way even to the merest details, such as both liking identically the same things to eat, seasoned the identical way. We both liked to do the identical things without a single exception. Perhaps one exception, he had a fondness in his heart for firearms that I could not share. The gleam in his eyes when he got out his collection every so often to clean and oil it. I liked guns, provided I did not have to shoot at anything alive with them. But pistols, I just plain did not like at all. We rarely could pass one of these shooting galleries without trying our luck at five cents for so many turns, had clay pigeons or rabbits whirling around on whatnots. But that was as wild as I ever wanted to get with a gun we liked the same friends without exception the same books the same pictures the same music he wrote once we the two of us love each other like to do things together absolutely anything don't need or want anybody else and the world is ours mrs willard once told me that if she had read about our life together in a book she would not have believed it she did not know that any one on earth could live like that perhaps that is one reason why i want to tell about it because it was just so plain wonderful day in day out i feel too that i have a complete record of our life for fourteen years every day that we were not together we wrote to each other with the exception of two short camping trips that carl made where mail could be sent out only by chance returning campers somehow i find myself thinking here of our wedding anniversaries spread over half the globe and the joy we got out of just those ten occasions the first one was back in oakland after our return from seattle we still had elements of convention left in us then or rather i still had some i don't believe carl had a streak of it in him ever so we dressed in our very best clothes dress suit and all and we had dinner at the key route inn where we had gone after the wedding a year before after dinner we rushed home i nursed the sun we changed into natural clothes and went to the circus I had misgivings about the circus being a fitting wedding anniversary celebration, but what was one to do when the circus comes to town but one night in the year? The second anniversary was in Cambridge. We always used to laugh each year and say, Gracious, if anyone had told us a year ago we'd be here this September 7th. Every year we were somewhere we never dreamed we would be. The first September 7th, the night of the wedding, we were to be in seattle for years selling bonds what a fearful prospect in retrospect compared to what we really did the second september back in oakland we thought we were to be in the bond business for years in oakland more horrible thoughts as i look back upon it the third september seventh the second anniversary lo and behold was in cambridge massachusetts whoever would have guessed it in all the world it was three days after carl's return from that awful freeburg summer we left nandy with a kind-hearted neighbor and away we spreed to boston to the matinee and something good to eat then whoever would have imagined for a moment that the next year we would be celebrating in berlin dinner at the cafe rheingold with wine 
the fourth anniversary was at heidelberg one of the red letter days as i look back upon those magic years we left home early with our lunch which we ate on a bed of dry leaves in a fairy birch forest back and a good ways up in the odenwald then we walked and walked almost twenty miles all told through little forest hamlets stopping now and then at some small inn along the roadside for a cheese sandwich or a glass of beer by nightfall we reached neckersteinach and the railroad and prowled around the twisted narrow streets till train time gazing often at our beloved dillsburg crowning the hilltop across the river her ancient castle tower and town walls showing black against the starlight the happiness the foreign untouristed wonder of that day our fifth anniversary was another red-letter day one of the days that always made me feel in looking back on it that we must have been people in a novel an english novel that it could not really have been carl and i who walked that perfect saturday from swanage to studland but it was our own two joyous souls who explored that quaint english thatched roof moss-covered corner of creation who poked about the wee old mouldy church and cemetery who had tea and muffins and jam out under an old gnarled apple tree behind a thatched roof cottage what a wonder of a day it was and indeed it was my carl and i who walked the few miles home toward sunset swinging hands along the downs and fairly speechless with the glory of five years married and england and our love i should like to be thinking of that day just before i die it was so utterly perfect and so ours our sixth anniversary was another yes yet another red-letter memory one of those times that the world seemed to have been leading up to since it first cooled down we left our robust sons in the care of our beloved aunt elsie turner that was back in berkeley and one saturday we fared forth plus sleeping bags frying pan fishing rod and a rifle we rode to the end of the ocean shore line but first got off the train at half moon bay bought half a dozen eggs from a lonely-looking female made for the beach and fried said eggs for supper then we got back on another train and stepped off at the end of the line in utter darkness we decided that somewhere we should find a suitable wooded nook where we could sequester ourselves for the night we stumbled along until we could not see another inch in front of us for the dark and the thick fog so we made camp which meant spreading our two bags in what looked like as auspicious a spot as was findable when we opened our eyes to the morning sunlight we discovered we were on the perfectly barren open ploughed piece of land and had slept so near the road that if a machine passing along in the night had skidded out a bit to the side it would have removed our feet that day sunday was our anniversary and the lord was with us early and late though not obtrusively we got a farmer out of bed to buy some eggs for our breakfast he wanted to know what we were doing out so early anyhow we told him celebrating our sixth wedding anniversary whereat he positively refused to take a cent for the eggs wedding present he said around noon we passed a hunter who stopped to chat and ended by presenting us with a cottontail rabbit to cook for dinner and such a dinner by a bit of a stream up in the hills that afternoon late we stumbled on a deserted farmhouse almost at the summit trees laden with apples and the ground red with them pears and a few peaches for the picking and a spring of ice-cold water with one last fat trout in it that i tried for hours to catch by fair means or foul but he merely waved his tail slowly as if to say one wedding present you don't get we slept that night on some hay left in an old barn lots of mice and gnawy things about but i could not get nearly as angry at a gnawy mouse as at a fat conceited trout who refused to be caught next day was a holiday so we kept on our way rejoicing and slept that night under great redwoods beside a stream where trout had better manners after a fish breakfast we potted a tin can full of holes with the rifle and then bore down circuitously and regretfully on redwood city and the southern pacific railway and home and college and dishes to wash and socks to darn but uproarious and joyful sons to compensate the seventh anniversary was less exciting but that could not be helped we were over in alamo with my father small brother and sister visiting us at the time 
or rather, of course, the place was theirs to begin with. There was no one to leave the blessed sons with. Also, Carl was working for the Immigration and Housing Commission, and no holidays. But he managed to get home a bit early. We had an early supper, got the sons in bed, hitched up the old horse to the old cart, and off we fared in the moonlight. Married seven years, and not sorry. We just poked about, ending at Danville with Danville ice cream and Danville pumpkin pie, then walked the horse all the way back to Alamo and home. Our eighth anniversary, as mentioned, was in our very own home in Berkeley, with the curtains drawn, the telephone plugged, and our Europe spread out before our eyes. The ninth anniversary was still too soon after the June bug's arrival for me to get off the hill and back, up our 217 steps home, so we celebrated under our own roof again, this time with a roast chicken and ice cream dinner, with the entire family participating except the june bug who did almost nothing then but sleep i tell you if ever we had chicken the bones were not worth salvaging by the time we got through we made it last at least two meals and a starving tom cat would pass by what was left with a scornful sniff our tenth and last anniversary was in seattle carl had to be at camp lewis all day but he got back in time to meet me at six thirty in the lobby of the hotel washington from there we went to our own favorite place, Blanks, for dinner. Shut away behind a green lattice arbor effect, we celebrated ten years of joy and riches and deep contentment, and as usual asked ourselves, what in the world shall we be doing a year from now? Where in the world shall we be? And as usual we answered, bring the future what it may, we have ten years that no power in heaven or earth can rob us of. There was another occasion in our lives that I want to put down in black and white, though it does not come under wedding anniversaries, but it was such a celebration. Uncle Max allowed that before we left Berkeley, we must go off on a spree with him, and suggested, imagine, Del Monte, the twelve and a half cent Parkers at Del Monte. That was one spot we had never seen ourselves even riding by. We got our beloved nurse Balch out to stay with the young and when a brand new green pierce arrow about the size of our whole living room honked without we were ready bag and baggage for a spree such as we had never imagined ourselves having in this world or the next we called for the daughter of the head of the philosophy department max had said to bring a friend along to make four so four we whisked the dust of berkeley from our wheels and presto del monte Parents of three children, who do most of their own work besides, do not need to be told in detail what those four days meant. Parents of three children know what the hours of, say, seven to nine mean at home, nor does work stop at nine. It is one mad whirl to get the family ears washed and teeth cleaned and chew your mush and wipe your mouth and where's your speller and Jim come back here and put on your rubbers. Where are my rubbers? Ah, oh, God, where? try six times to get the butcher line busy breakfast dishes to clear up baby to bathe dress feed count the laundry forget all about the butcher until fifteen minutes before dinner laundry calls telephone rings seven times neighbor calls to borrow an egg telephone the milkman for a pound of butter make the beds telephone rings in the middle two beds do not get made till three start lunch wash the baby's clothes telephone rings three times while you are in the basement rice burns doorbell gas and electric bill telephone rings patch boys overalls water bill stir the pudding telephone rings try to read at least the table of contents of the new republic neighbor calls to return some flour stir the pudding again mad stamping up the front steps son's home forget to scrape their feet forget to take off their rubbers dad's whistle hooray lunch let's stop about here and return to del monte this is where music would help. The home motif would be, I do not know those music terms, but a lot of jumpy notes up and down the piano, fast and never catching up. Del Monte motif, slow, lazy melody, ending with dance music for nighttime. In plain English, what Del Monte meant was a carefree, absolutely carefree, jaunt into another world it was not our world we could have been happy forever did we never lay eyes on del monte and yet oh it was such fun 
think of lazing in bed till eight or eight thirty then taking a leisurely bath then dressing and deliberately using up time doing it put one shoe on and look at it for a spell then when you are good and ready put on the next just feeling sort of spunky about it just wanting to show someone that time is nothing to you what's the hurry then oh what motif of music could do a del monte breakfast justice just yesterday you were gulping down a bite in between getting the family fed and off here you were holding hands under the table to make sure you were not dreaming while you took minutes and minutes to eat fruit and mush and eggs and coffee and waffles and groaned to think that there was still so much on the menu that would cost you nothing to keep on consuming but where oh where put it after rocking a spell in the sun on the front porch the green pierce arrow appears and all honk off for the day four boxes of picnic lunch stowed away by a gracious waiter not a piece of bread for it did you have to spread yourself basking in the sun under cypress trees talking over every subject under heaven back in time for a swim a rest before dinner then dinner why oh why has the human such biological limitations then a concert then dancing then crowning glory of an unlimited bank account napa soda lemonade and bed oh what a four days in thinking over the intimate things of our life together i have difficulty deciding what the finest features of it were there was so much that made it rich so much to make me realize i was blessed beyond anyone else that i am indebted to the world forever for the color that living with carl parker gave to existence perhaps one of the most helpful memories to me now is the thought of his absolute faith in me from the time we were first in love it meant a new zest in life to know that carl firmly believed there was nothing i could not do for all that i hold no orthodox belief in immortality i could no more get away from that idea that if i fail in anything now why i can't fail think of carl's faith in me about four days before he died he looked up at me once as i was arranging his pillow and said so seriously you know there isn't a university in the country that wouldn't give you your phd without you taking an examination for it he was delirious it's true but nevertheless it expressed though indeed in a very exaggerated form the way he had of thinking i was somebody i knew there was no one in the world like him but i had sound reasons for that oh but it is wonderful to live with someone who thinks you are wonderful it does not make you conceited not a bit but it makes a happy singing feeling in your heart to feel that the one you love best in the world is proud of you and there is always the incentive of vowing that some day you will justify it all the fun of dressing for a party in a hand-me-down dress from some relative knowing that the one you wanted most to please will honestly believe and say on the way home that you were the best-looking one at the party the fun of cooking for a man who thinks every dish set before him is the best food he ever ate and not only say it but act that way that was just a sample give me a real dish of it now that i know it's the best pudding i ever tasted End of chapter 15section sixteen of an american idol this librivox recording is in the public domain read by mary schneider an american idol the life of carlton h parker by cornelia stratton parker chapter sixteen as soon as the i w w article was done carl had to begin on his paper to be read before the economic association just after christmas in philadelphia that was fun working over come up here and let me read you this and we'd go over that much of the paper together then more reading to miss van doren more correctings finally finishing it just the day before he had to leave but that was partly because he had to leave earlier than expected the government had telegraphed him to go on to washington to mediate a threatened longshoremen strike carl worked harder over the longshoremen than any other single labor difficulty not expecting the eight-hour day in lumber here again i do not feel free to go into details 
the matter was finally at carl's suggestion taken to washington the longshoremen interested carl for the same reason that the migratory and the i w w interested him in fact there were many i w w among them it was the lower stratum of the labor world hard physical labor irregular work and on the whole undignified treatment by the men set over them and they reacted as carl expected men in such a position to react yet on the side of the workers he felt that in this particular instance it was a case of men being led by stubborn egotistical union delegates not really representing the wishes of the rank and file of union members their main idea being to compromise on nothing on the other hand be it said that he considered the employers he had to deal with here the fairest most open-minded most anxious to compromise in the name of justice of all the groups of employers he ever had to deal with the whole affair was nerve-wracking as is best illustrated by the fact that while carl was able to hold the peace as long as he was on the job three days after his death the situation blew up on his way east he stopped off in spokane to talk with the lumbermen east of the mountains there at a big meeting he was able to put over the eight-hour day the wilson mediation commission was in seattle at the time felix frankfurter telephoned out his congratulations to me and said quote, we consider it the single greatest achievement of its kind since the united states entered the war End quote. the papers were full of it and excitement ran high president wilson was telegraphed to by the labor commission and he in turn telegraphed back his pleasure in addition the east coast lumbermen agreed to carl's scheme of an employment manager for their industry and detailed him to find a man for the job while in the east my but i was excited not only that but they bade fair to let him inaugurate a system which would come nearer than any chance he could have expected to try out on a big scale his theories on the proper handling of labor the men were to have the sanest recreation devisable for their needs and interests out-of-door sports movies housing that would permit of dignified family life recreation centers good and proper food alteration in the old order of hire and fire and general control over the men most employers argued don't forget that the type of men we have in the lumber camps won't know how to make use of a single reform you suggest and probably won't give a straw for the whole thing to which carl would reply don't forget that your old conditions have drawn the type of man you have this won't change men overnight by a long shot but it will at once relieve the tension and see in five years if your type itself has not undergone a change from washington d c he wrote the city is one mad mess of men desolate and hunting for folks they should see overcharged by hotels and away from their wives the red-letter event of washington was when he was taken for tea to justice brandeis's we talked i w w unemployment etc and he was oh so grand a few days later two days before christmas mrs brandeis telephoned and asked him for christmas dinner that was a great event in the parker annals justice brandeis having been a hero among us for some years carr wrote he is all he is supposed to be and more he in turn wrote to me after carl's death quote, our country shares with you the great loss your husband was among the very few americans who possessed the character knowledge and insight which are indispensable in dealing effectively with our labor problem appreciation of his value was coming rapidly and events were enforcing his teachings his journey to the east brought inspiration to many and i seek comfort in the thought that among the students at the university there will be some at least who are eager to carry forward his work End quote. there were sessions with gompers meyer bloomfield secretary baker secretary daniels the shipping board and many others then at philadelphia came the most telling single event of our economic lives carl's paper before the economic association on motives in economic life at the risk of repeating to some extent the ideas quoted from previous papers i shall record here a few statements from this one 
as it gives the last views he held on his field of work. Quote, our conventional economics today analyzes no phase of industrialism or the wage relationship or citizenship in pecuniary society in a matter to offer a key to such distressing and complex problems as this. Human nature riots today through our economic structure with ridicule and destruction, and we economists look on helpless and aghast. The menace of the war does not seem potent to quiet revolt or still class cries. The anxiety and apprehension of the economist should not be produced by this cracking of his economic system, but by the poverty of the criticism of industrialism which his science offers. Why are economists mute in the presence of a most obvious crisis in our industrial society? Why have our criticisms of industrialism no sturdy warnings about this unhappy evolution? Why does an agitated officialdom search today in vain among our writings for scientific advice touching labor efficiency or industrial disloyalty? for prophecies and plans about the rise in our industrialism of economic classes unharmonious and hostile the fair answer seems this we economists speculate little on human motives we are not curious about the great basis of fact which dynamic and behavioristic psychology has gathered to illustrate the instinct stimulus to human activity most of us are not interested to think of what a psychologically full or satisfying life is we are not curious to know that a great school of behavior analysis called the freudian has been built around the analysis of the energy outbursts brought by society's balking of the native human instincts our economic literature shows that we are but rarely curious to know whether industrialism is suited to man's inherited nature or what man in turn will do to our rules of economic conduct in case these rules are repressive the motives to economic activity which have done the major service in orthodox economic texts and teachings have been either the vague middle-class virtues of thrift justice and solvency or the equally vague moral sentiments of striving for the welfare of others desire for the larger self desire to equip oneself well or lastly the labor-saving deduction that man is stimulated in all things economic by his desire to satisfy his wants with the smallest possible effort all this gentle parody in motive theorizing continued contemporaneously with the output of the rich literature of social and behavioristic psychology which was almost entirely addressed to this very problem of human motives in modern economic society noteworthy exceptions are the remarkable series of books by veblen the articles and criticisms of mitchell and patton and the most significant small book by tausig entitled inventors and money makers it is this complementary field of psychology to which the economist must turn as these writers have turned for a vitalization of their basic hypotheses there awaits them a bewildering array of studies of the motives emotions and folkways of our pecuniary civilization generalizations and experiment statistics abound ready-made for any structure of economic criticism the human motives are isolated described compared business confidence the release of work energy advertising appeal market vagaries the basis of value computations decay of workmanship labor unrest decline in the thrift habit are the subjects treated all human activity is untiringly actuated by the demand for realization of the instinct wants if an artificially limited field of human endeavor be called economic life all its so-called motives hark directly back to the human instincts for their origin there are in truth no economic motives as such the motives of economic life are the same as those of the life of art of vanity and ostentation of war and crime of sex economic life is merely the life in which instinct gratification is alleged to take on a rational pecuniary habit form 
man is not less a father with a father's parental instinct just because he passes down the street from his home to his office his business raid into his rival's market has the same naive charm that tickled the heart of his remote ancestor when in the night he rushed the herds of a nearby clan a manufacturer tries to tell a conventional world that he resists the closed shop because it is un-american it loses him money or it is inefficient a few years ago he was more honest when he said he would run his business as he wished and would allow no man to tell him what to do his instinct of leadership reinforced powerfully by his innate instinctive revulsion to the confinement of the closed shop gave the true stimulus his opposition is psychological not ethical End quote he then goes on to catalogue and explain the following instincts which he considered of basic importance in any study of economics one gregariousness two parental bent motherly behavior kindliness three curiosity manipulation workmanship four acquisition collecting ownership five fear and flight six mental activity thought seven the housing or settling instinct eight migration homing nine hunting Quote, historic revivals of hunting urge make an interesting recital of religious inquisitions witch burnings college hazings persecutions of suffragettes of the i w w of the japanese or of the pacifist all this goes on often under naive rationalization about justice and patriotism but it is pure and innate lust to run something down and hurt it End quote. ten anger pugnacity eleven revolt at confinement at being limited in liberty of action and choice twelve revulsion thirteen leadership and mastery fourteen subordination submission fifteen display vanity ostentation sixteen sex after quoting from professor cannon and discussing the contributions that his studies have made to the subject of man's reaction to his immediate environment he continues quote, the conclusion seems both scientific and logical that behavior in anger fear pain and hunger is a basically different behavior from behavior under repose and economic security the emotions generated under the conditions of existence peril seem to make the emotions and motives generative in quiet and peace pale and unequal it seems impossible to avoid the conclusion that the most vital part of man's inheritance is one which destines him to continue for some myriads of years ever a fighting animal when certain conditions exist in his environment though through education man be habituated in social and intelligent behavior or through license in sexual debauchery still at those times when his life or liberty is threatened his instinct emotional nature will inhibit either social thought or sex ideas and present him as merely an irrational fighting animal the instincts and their emotions coupled with the obedient body lay down in scientific and exact description the motives which must and will determine human conduct if a physical environment set itself against the expression of these instinct motives the human organism is fully and efficiently prepared for a tenacious and destructive revolt against its environment and if the antagonism persist the organism is ready to destroy itself and disappear as a species if it fail of a psychical mutation which would make the perverted order endurable and in conclusion he writes the dynamic psychology of today describes the present civilization as a repressive environment for a great number of its inhabitants a sufficient self-expression is denied there is for those who care to see a deep and growing unrest and pessimism with the increase in knowledge is coming a new realization of the irrational direction of economic evolution the economists however view economic inequality and life degradation as objects in truth outside the science our value concept is a price mechanism hiding behind a phrase 
if we are to play a part in the social readjustment immediately ahead we must put human nature and human motives into our basic hypotheses our value concept must be the yardstick to measure just how fully things and institutions contribute to a full psychological life we must know more of the meaning of progress the domination of society by one economic class has for its chief evil the thwarting of the instinct life of the subordinate class and the perversion of the upper class the extent and characteristics of this evil are to be estimated only when we know the innate potentialities and inherited propensities of man and the ordering of this knowledge and its application to the changeable economic structure is the task before the trained economist today End quote. a little later i saw one of the big men who was at that economic association meeting and he said i don't see why parker isn't spoiled he was the most talked about man at the convention six publishing houses wrote after that paper to see if he could enlarge it into a book somehow it did seem as if now more than ever the world was ours we looked ahead into the future and wondered if it could seem as good to any one as it did to us it was almost too good we were dazed a bit by it it is one of the things i just cannot let myself ever think of that future and the plans we had anything i can ever do now will still leave life so utterly dull by comparison End of chapter 16「17 of an american idol this librivox recording is in the public domain read by mary schneider an american idol the life of carlton h parker by cornelia stratton parker chapter 17 one of the days in seattle that i think of most was about a month before the end the father of a great friend of ours died and carl and i went to the funeral one sunday afternoon we got in late so stood in a corner by the door and held hands and seemed to own each other especially hard that day afterwards we prowled around the streets talking of funerals and old age most of the people there that afternoon were gray-haired the family had lived in seattle for years and years and these were the friends of years and years back carl said that is something we can't have when you and i die the old old friends who have stood by us year in and year out it is one of the phases of life you sacrifice when you move around at the rate we do but in the first place neither of us wants a funeral and in the second place we feel that moving gives more than it takes away so we are satisfied then we talked about our own old age planned for it in detail carl declared i want you to promise me faithfully you will make me stop teaching when i am sixty i have seen too much of the tragedy of men hanging on and on and students and education being sacrificed because the teacher has lost his fire has fallen behind in the parade i feel now as if i'd never grow old that doesn't mean that i won't so no matter how strong i may be going at sixty make me stop promise then we discussed our plans by that time the children would be looking out for themselves very much so and we could plan as we pleased it was to be england some suburb outside of london where we could get into big things and yet where we could be peaceful and by ourselves and read and write and have the young economists who were travelling about out to spend weekends with us and then we could keep our grandchildren while their parents were travelling in europe about a month from that day he was dead there is a path i must take daily to my work at college which passes through the university botanical garden every day i must brace myself for it for there growing along the path is a clump of old-fashioned morning glories always from the time we first came back to teach in berkeley and passed along the same path to the university we planned to have morning glories like those the odor came to meet you yards away growing along the path to the little home we would at last settle down in when we were old we used always to remark pictures in the newspapers of so-and-so on their golden anniversary and would plan about our own golden wedding day old age together always seemed so good to think about there was a time when we used to plan to live in a lighthouse way out on some point when we got old 
it made a strong appeal it really did we planned many ways of growing old not that we talked of it often perhaps twice a year but always always it was of course together strange that neither of us ever dreamed one would grow old without the other and yet too there is the other side i found a letter written during our first summer back in berkeley just after we had said good-bye at the station when carl left for chicago among other things he wrote it just makes me feel bad to see other folks living put-in lives when we two four have loved through harvard and europe and it has only commenced and no one is loving so hard or living so happily i am most willing to die now if you die with me for we have lived one complete life of joy already and then he added if only the adding of it could have made it come true but we have fifty years yet to love oh it was so true that we packed into ten years the happiness that could normally be considered to last a lifetime a long lifetime sometimes it seems almost as if we must have guessed it was to end so soon and lived so as to crowd in all the joy we could while our time together was given us i say so often that i stand right now the richest woman in the world why talk of sympathy i have our three precious marvelously healthy children i have perfect health myself i have all and more than i can handle of big ambitious maturing plans with a chance to see them carried out i have enough to live on and greatest of all fifteen years of perfect memories and yet to hear a snatch of a tune and know that the last time you heard it you were together perhaps it was the very music they played as you left the theatre arm in arm that last night to put on a dress you have not worn for some time and remember that when you last had it on it was the night you went just the two of you to blank's for dinner to meet unexpectedly some friend and recall that the last time you saw him it was that night you two strolling with hands clasped met him on second avenue accidentally and chatted on the corner to come across a necktie in a trunk to read a book he had marked to see his handwriting perhaps just the address on an old baggage check oh one can sound so much braver than one feels and then because you have tried so hard to live up to the pride and faith he had in you to be told you know i am surprised that you haven't taken carl's death harder you seem to be just the same exactly what is seeming time and time again these months i have thought what do any of us know about what another person feels a smile a laugh i used to think of course they stood for happiness there can be many smiles much laughter and it means nothing but surely anything is kinder for a friend to see than tears when carl returned from the east in january he was more rushed than ever his time more filled than ever with strike mediations street-car arbitrations cost-of-living surveys for the government conferences on lumber production in all he had mediated thirty-two strikes sat on two arbitration boards made three cost-of-living surveys for the government mediations did gall him he grew intellectually impatient over this eternal patching up of what he was wont to call a rotten system of course he saw the war emergency need of it just then but what he wanted to work on was why were mediations ever necessary what social and economic order would best ensure absence of friction on the campus work piled up he had promised to give a course on employment management especially to train men to go into the lumber industries with a new vision each big company east of the mountains was to send a representative it was also open to seniors in college and a splendid group it was almost every one pledged to take up employment management as their vocation on graduation no fear that they would take it up with a capitalist bias then his friends and i had to laugh it was so like him the afternoon of the morning he arrived he was in the thick of a scrap on the campus over a principle he held to tenaciously the abolition of the one-year modern language requirement for students in his college to use his own expression he went to the bat on it and at a faculty meeting that afternoon it carried he had been working this little campaign for a couple of months but in his absence in the east the other side had been busy 
he returned just in time for the fray every one knows what a farce one year of a modern language is at college even several of the language teachers themselves were frank enough to admit it but it was an academic tradition i think the two words that upset karl most were efficiency and tradition both being used too often as an excuse for practices that did more harm than good and then came one tuesday the fifth of march he had his hands full all morning with the continued threatened upheavals of the longshoremen about noon the telephone rang threatened strike in all the flour mills dr parker must come at once i am reminded of a description which was published of karl as a mediator he thought of himself as a physician and of an industry on strike as the patient and he did not merely ease the patient's pain with opiates he used the knife and tried for permanent cures i finally reached him by telephone his voice sounded tired for he had had a very hard morning by one o'clock he was working on the flour mill situation he could not get home for dinner about midnight he appeared having sat almost twelve hours steadily on the new flour difficulty he was all in he said the next morning one of the rare instances in our years together he claimed that he did not feel like getting up but there were four important conferences that day to attend to besides his work at college he dressed ate breakfast then said he felt feverish his temperature was a hundred and two i made him get back into bed let all the conferences on earth explode the next day his temperature was a hundred and five this has taught us our lesson no more living at this pace i don't need two reminders that i ought to call a halt thursday friday and saturday he lay there too weary to talk not able to sleep at all nights the doctor coming regularly but unable to tell just what the trouble was other than a breakdown saturday afternoon he felt a little better we planned then what we would do when he got well the doctor said that he should allow himself at least a month before going back to college one month given to us just think of the writing i can get done being around home with my family there was an article for tossig half done to appear in the quarterly journal of economics a more technical analysis of the i w w than had appeared in the atlantic monthly he had just begun a review for the american journal of economics of hoxie's trade unionism then he was full of ideas for a second article he had promised the atlantic is the united states a nation and think of being able to see all i want of the june bug since he had not slept for three nights the doctor left powders which i was to give him for saturday night still he could not sleep he thought that if i read aloud to him in a monotonous tone of voice he could perhaps drop off i got a high school copy of from milton to tennyson and read every sing-song poem i could find the ancient mariner twice hardly pronouncing the words as i droned along then he began to get delirious it is a very terrifying experience to see for the first time a person in delirium and that person the one you love most on earth all night long i sat there trying to quiet him it was always some mediation some committee of employers he was attending he would say i'm so tired can't you people come to some agreement so that i can go home and sleep at first i would say dearest you must be quiet and try to go to sleep but i can't leave the meeting he would look at me in such distress so i learned my part and at each new discussion he would get into i would suggest here's will ogburn just come he'll take charge of the meeting for you you come home with me and go to sleep so he would introduce will to the gathering and add gentlemen my wife wants me to go home with her and go to sleep good-bye for a few moments he would be quiet then oh my lord something to investigate what is it this time i would cut in hastily the government feels next week will be plenty of time for this investigation he would look at me seriously did you ever know the government to give you a week's time to begin then telegrams more telegrams nobody keeps their word nobody about six o'clock in the morning i could wait no longer and called the doctor he pronounced it pneumonia an absolutely different case from any he had ever seen no sign of it the day before 
though it was what he had been watching for all along every hospital in town was full a splendid trained nurse came at once to the house the best nurse in the whole city the doctor announced with relief wednesday afternoon the crisis seemed to have passed that whole evening he was himself and i i was almost delirious with sheer joy to hear his dear voice again just talking naturally he noticed the nurse for the first time he was jovial happy i'm going to get some fun out of this now he smiled and oh won't we have a time my girl while i am convalescing and we planned the rosiest week anyone ever planned thursday the nurse shaved him he not only joked and talked like his dear old self he looked it as well all along he had been cheerful always told the doctor he was feeling fine never complained of anything it amused the doctor so one morning when he was leaning over listening to carl's heart and lungs as he lay in more or less of a doze and partial delirium a twinkle suddenly came into carl's eye you sprung a new necktie on me this morning didn't you sure enough it was new thursday morning the nurse was preparing things for his bath in another room and i was with carl the sun was streaming in through the windows and my heart was too contented for words he said do you know what i've been thinking of so much this morning i've been thinking of what it must be to go through a terrible illness and not have someone you love desperately around i say to myself all the while just think my girl was here all the time my girl will be here all the time i've lain here this morning and wondered more than ever what good angel was hovering over me the day i met you i put this in because it is practically the last thing he said before delirium came on again and i love to think of it he said really more than that in the morning he would start calling for me early the nurse would try to soothe him for a while then would call me i wanted to be in his room at night but they would not let me there was an unborn life to be thought of those days too as soon as i reached his bed he would clasp my hand and hold it oh so tight i've been groping for you all night all night why don't you let me find you then in a moment he would not know i was there daytimes i had not left him five minutes except for my meals several nights they had finally let me be by him anyway saturday morning for the first time since the crisis the doctor was encouraged things are really looking up and you go out for a few moments in the sun i walked a few blocks to the mudgets of our department to tell them the good news and then back but my heart sank to its depths again as soon as i entered carl's room the delirium always affected me that way to see the vacant stare in his eyes no look of recognition when i entered the nurse went out that afternoon he's doing nicely was the last thing she said she had not been gone half an hour it was just two fifteen and i was lying on her bed watching carl when he called buddy i'm going come hold my hand oh my god i dashed for him i clung to him i told him he could not must not go we needed him too terribly we loved him too much to spare him i felt so sure of it that i said why my love is enough to keep you here he would not let me leave him to call the doctor i just knelt there holding both his hands with all my might talking talking telling him we were not going to let him go and then at last the color came back into his face he nodded his head a bit and said i'll stay very quietly then i was able to rush for the stairs and tell mrs willard to telephone for the doctor three doctors we had that afternoon they reported the case as dangerous but not absolutely hopeless his heart which had been so wonderful all along had given out that very morning the doctor had said i wish my pulse was as strong as that and there he lay no pulse at all they did everything our own doctor stayed till about ten then left with carl resting fairly easily he lived only a block away about one thirty the nurse had me call the doctor again i could see things were going wrong once carl started to talk rather loud i tried to quiet him and he said twice i pulled and fought and struggled to live just for you one of the times had been during the crisis let me just talk if i want to 
I can't make the fight a third time. I'm so tired. Before the doctor could get there, he was dead. With our beliefs what they were, there was only one thing to be done. We had never discussed it in detail, but I felt absolutely sure I was doing as he would have me do. His body was cremated without any service whatsoever. Nobody present but one of his brothers and a good friend. The next day the men scattered his ashes out on the waters of Puget Sound. I feel it was as he would have had it. A quote. Out of our welded lives, welded in spirit, and in the comradeship that you had in his splendid work, you know everything that I could say. I grieve for you deeply, and I rejoice for any woman who, for even a few short years, is given the great gift in such a form. End of chapter 17 End of an American Idol